Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Sarah Hardy, and I'm the curator of the De Morgan Foundation's collection. And thank you for joining me today for this lunchtime lecture on a make-believe menagerie in pre-Raphaelite paintings. Today I'll be going through a great number of pictures. There are a lot of slides to get through as it's quite a big topic. So I have condensed that down into some categories, which I'll share with you in a second. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping is that you won't be able to turn on your cameras or microphones. So if you do have anything to say, please pop that into the chat box. Because it's me giving the talk and doing all of the maintenance today, I do find it quite uh, distracting to look at the chat box throughout the talk. So I might pause, say, every 15 minutes just to check that rather than having it constantly open whilst I'm speaking, which I hope uh, you will all, uh, that will be fine for everybody. If one person could just give me a quick wave to say, yes or a quick note in the chat box just to say that you can hear me and that the sound's okay and all the visuals are working that would be much appreciated great thank you very much everybody i'm going to get started so as i said i've categorized this huge subject to sort of uh, dissect it down into bite-sized pieces really as we start to tackle some of the uh, reasons why and some of the animals themselves that the pre-Raphaelites used in their artwork. So we're going to look at which animals they were and maybe try and ponder reasons or look at some reasons as to why they were using animals at all. This will take us through fantastical beasts, why they wanted to blur the lines between myth and reality or fantasy and reality, through the symbolism of various uh, different animals that were used. We'll look at the realism that was important to the pre-Raphaelites. One of the founding principles of the artistic movement was getting close to nature. Um, you've got to remember that the pre-Raphaelite uh, Brotherhood was founded uh, just before Charles Darwin's um, uh, The Origin of Species was published. So there was a real interest in um, animal uh, science at the time and then we'll look at formal fauna so forget everything I've just said and look at how some artists are turned to the animal kingdom purely to be decorative. This is a talk I've wanted to do for a while uh, so thank you for bearing with me whilst I got round to it but really there was one artwork in particular that had inspired um, my thinking and my interest particularly into why artists used animals or the animal kingdom to blur the lines between fantasy and reality and one picture in particular was uh, this um, oil sketch uh, so sorry colour chalk and, and watercolour uh, sketch by Edward Byrne Jones um, which is called A Family of Mermaids. So I'm sure everybody's aware Edward Byrne Jones was a good friend of William Morris. And whilst he wasn't a technically a pre-Raphaelite, he did work very closely to the movement. He had been an apprentice to Dante Gabriel Rossetti, who was one of the founding members of the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the talk. And he was an amazing creative genius, working in every medium from oil painting through to uh, watercolors, even designing great schemes for stained glass. So really someone who was quite uh, the artist. So why then have I chosen to focus on this tiny sketch? Um, you know, it's a very crudely drawn. It's because of an inscription on the reverse. And unfortunately, I couldn't find a photograph of this with you. So you have to take my word for it. But on the reverse of this um, oil, is the artist's inscription drawn from life? Well, I just absolutely loved that idea that Edward Byrne Jones might um, have dreamt up or imagined actually seeing this family of mermaids at play um, and to go as far as to not just imagine the scene and um, commit it to a painting and therefore making it its own reality but to go as far as to use the the words and the sentiment behind that that he could have drawn this scene from life I think shows a deeper level of engaging with the fantasy which is just something that I think is um, so interesting in artwork from this period. Ben Jones's sort of fondness for the theme of the scene in For the Mermaid is quite rightly linked to his um, movement in 1880 from uh, living in London, not permanently, but he bought a retreat in Rottingdean near Brighton on the Sussex coast, which he would retreat from London to. Um, and Georgiana Byrne Jones, his wife, who we'll hear a little bit more about in the talk, um, actually moved there permanently after his death in 1898. So it's a very special place for the family. Lots of different artists went down to Brighton and to Rottingdean with Burne Jones and, um, and visited and, um, you know, to the point where he opened a pub in one of the buildings um, of the house in Rottingdean and called it the Merry Mermaid. And here we have a, 
a, a beautiful drawing of the house in Rottingdean, including the blue plaque, which is now there if you do go down to visit, uh, by Eric Trailer Cook, who's one of the artists inspired by the area and you know, being down on the sea. And um, we know that he would uh, engage with that subject of mermaids and had done previously, but it was really after the move to Rottingdean, which he sort of imagined himself watching mermaids frolicking in the waves. Um, he really loved it in Rottingdean, you know, there was a windmill, a duck pond, he really got involved in um, the, the sort of the life, but it was definitely the sea that, um, that really inspired him, and he made a number of notes to himself in his workbook, which is a fantastically useful reference uh, that thankfully exists as of what he was painting at each period and how he went about that. And the work record in 1882 states um, that I made many designs of sea nymphs and children, which is such a, you know, a wonderful idea. Again, you know, he's saying he's making these designs and we can picture him doing that on plein air, sat outside his home in Rottingdean, looking at the sea and taking inspiration from the shapes of the waves and the fish to conjure up these mythical beasts. Georgiana Byrne-Jones expanded on this. Um, her memorials and um, the uh, biography that she wrote of her husband which is very thorough if you want to know more about Ben Jones um, and quotes him saying I designed many scenes of under the sea of mermaids mermen merbabies the best were merwife giving her merbaby an air bath and it howling with misery so an element of humor in there as well he also says there are four designs of hide and seek a coral forest and mermaids dragging mortals down to the tragedies of the deep. And it was that idea that um, I think really is expressed in Burn Jones as perhaps most famous mermaid painting, uh, The Depths of the Sea, which he got round to by 1886. And this was exhibited in the Royal Academy's um, exhibition in 1886. So, and, uh, sorry. Um, I've had a message about graphics moving across the page. I hope everyone can see them all right. There is a lot of white on the slides because of the dimensions of the pictures. So just check that nothing's, nothing should be flashing. That should just be a, a slide with an image in the middle. I'll continue, I'll keep an eye on the chat. Uh, anyway, so this is a picture that lots of you may know, and I love that idea that um, this siren, this mer creature that Burn Jones is imagining at the bottom of the sea, sort of hauntingly looking out while she's dragging an already dead uh, prey, I suppose, if we're talking about mermaids as animals, um, in, in this sense, uh, down to the bottom of the sea into this sort of shallow grave. Um, this. Uh, Painting uh, is sort of common knowledge again. I think that um, the, the head uh, study for the mermaid um, was designed by Burne Jones or taken from life from a model or called Laura Littleton, who was a friend of the family. Um, and this pencil sketch really shows that, you know, he, he took the idea of taking um, drawing from life quite seriously. And I think then that's just an extra element to add to this sort of blurring of lines between fantasy and reality, if we know the name of the sitter. Um, this um, sort of enigmatic expression uh, really is what sets this painting apart from some of Burne Jones's. If you think of a Burne Jones type, um, it's that haunting look and that direct look out to the viewer that I think really um, sort of uh, puts the artist under a spell is um, a, a, a quote that the artist uh, wrote about Laura Littleton. Uh, very sadly, um, she passed away in childbirth at the beginning of 1886, prior to the exhibition of this drawing at the Royal Academy. Um, so uh, this sort of haunted um, Burne Jones and his wife Georgiana, and he was moved to make a memorial for her, which appears a little bit later um, in the slides. So another sea nymph by Burne Jones is this rather more decorative piece. And I like to think that this could have sort of 
hung as a pub sign, perhaps in Rottingdean on uh, the Merry Mermaid on the pub that he created. Signed and dated 1881, as you can see, so it predates the depths of the sea we've been looking at. And um, I like to think of that graphic arrangement uh, of the sea nymph here being very easily translated by Burne Jones into a collaborative wallpaper he made with William Morris. So a rare collaboration for a wallpaper design between those two artists. William Morris, of course, the great uh, sort of founder, I think we see him as of the arts and crafts movement. Uh, so an unusual wallpaper for him where he's got a sort of a human figure um, in there with these wonderful swirling acanthus sleeves uh, and a, you know, a really attractive design that probably was based on, um, on the drawing we've just seen. Mermaids were not exclusively a Burne Jones phenomenon at all. Uh, and um, both of the De Morgans, actually, William and Evelyn de Morgan, who were great friends um, with Edward Burne Jones, particularly around 1880, William de Morgan was quite close with Burne Jones. Um, and of course, uh, de Morgan went on to be one of the greatest ceramicists of the arts and crafts movement, married to Evelyn de Morgan, who was uh, a painter. And here we see a departure from some of the de Morgan sort of floral ceramics that we might be used to seeing to again see this idea of a mermaid family so um de morgan was really interested in using animals to portray fantasy and uh, again it was an artist who kind of really blurred these lines so we see this idea of mermaids being real tangible people in um, in this piece you know imagine the young children playing in the waves so it's not a formal uh, arrangement of figures at all it um it really speaks to as understanding the human nature of a creature that is, you know, by rights, um, completely fantastical. And that takes us on to this, one of my favorite pieces in the De Morgan collection, the grotesque monster dish. And here we have what we, you know, our, our brains automatically see as an eye at the center, and then we sort of make out a beak shape and a body. But of course, if you break down all the elements of that design, you're actually just left with a number of floral arrangements. So it's kind of up to the viewer um, in De Morgan's eyes, what they make of, uh, of this dish and whether we we see flowers or um, these sort of fantastical animals. And another favourite is de Morgan's fantastical ducks. We call them ducks. I'm happy to hear from people if they think they should be called something else. Again, a wonderful arrangement of geometric shapes executed probably in a sort of one stroke of the brush uh, with the glaze onto the tile, as you see here, where those sections meet up uh, and we get the darker colours in order to make these very expressive looking creatures. Um, but it's the eyes that really give them away as creatures and, and take them away from being purely decorative. So again, there's uh, some different dimensions going on. Whilst we're thinking about the fantastical beasts, um, I wanted to introduce this uh, rather wonderful painting by Millet. Millet, of course, the child prodigy and founder of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, one of those original seven members in 1848. By 1850, Millet had painted Ferdinand Lourdes by Ariel. Um, and it is, you know, just a, a really intriguing picture, mainly because of the animal elements in there. Um, it's a painting which uh, depicts Act One, Scene Two of Shakespeare's 1611 play, The Tempest, and it illustrates Ferdinand's lines, where should this music be, in the air or the earth? So again, that idea of, you know, is something around you or is it physical? Um, and he's listening to Ariel in this episode, sing the lyric, and I have practiced this, full fathom five, thy father lies got through it um, and you can see Ariel tipping Ferdinand's hat even though he's looking at her but we see the direction of his eyes and his sight actually going straight through her so it gives us this idea that she's an ethereal being a, a fairy a sprite um, and it's really that element of the painting that caused this um picture to have quite mixed reviews. The Athenaeum stated it was um, better in the painting um, than Christ in the house of his parents, so they liked it better than uh, that sort of blasphemous picture he'd uh, conjured up a couple of years before. Um, but the art journal said it had a considerable vein of eccentricity uh, in the portrayal of Ariel as hideous green gnome. Um, so you know, it wasn't really loved by critics, particularly not by the Times critics who said it was a deplorable example of perverted taste. And really the reason for that is the animals in this piece. 
Had um, Millet stopped at uh, depicting Ariel as this sort of green ethereal being, I rather think that might have been quite accepted. But it seems to be the addition of these um, sort of see-through bat-like creatures who are adopting the poses, if you look, of uh, hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil, um, that really again, sort of uh, ask the audience to engage with the possibilities of other realms and of a spiritual world quite beyond our ordinary. And they also take that idea of sweet little fairy into something a lot more sinister. And I think it was probably that that uh, made the critics sort of a little, uh, I think it was a bit un of an untasteful <laughs> picture. A good number of years after this picture is exhibited, so 65 years later, this same idea of using fantastical beasts um, to stand in for a world that isn't quite attainable to humankind was revisited by Evelyn de Morgan in her painting, The Captives. So this is the wife of William de Morgan, the ceramicist that we've met, uh, who was a, a, a wonderful painter right up until her death in 1919. And in this picture, we see supposedly on a trip to Cheddar Gorge, um, where she went and drew the stalactites and stalagmites from life, she then elaborated um, this cave painting scene with uh, women who, again, are adopting these poses of hear no evil, speak no evil and see no evil, um, with again, these sort of green ethereal dragons. Um, and in her wonderful book on pre-Raphaelite women, Jan Marsh describes these as the demons of the patriarchy. So what we can see here is that uh, De Morgan's using them in quite a different way. She's asking us to engage with the idea that uh, the patriarchy is perhaps a fading um, uh, element of society as we see these beings are not quite as solid as they should be. That's, uh, that's the artist's intention to paint the dragons in this way, sort of these translucent ethereal beings that aren't really that solid. And maybe the woman's awakening here is to do with the idea that um, uh, you know, the patriarchy is something that's omnipresent, but maybe fading in uh, the new world. And thankfully, de Morgan did live to see um, the, uh, the act that brought in the vote for some women in 1918. Um, she was an ardent suffrag just suffragist throughout her life, signing the declaration in favour of women's suffrage in 1889. So quite a different way of using the animals there. I think a lot of artists in the Victorian period turned to use mythology and mythological subjects in order to portray some of their ideas about the ills of society to their contemporaries without fear of maybe upsetting the status quo. So by this, I mean, there was a huge disparity in late 19th uh, Victorian society, late 19th century Victorian society, between the rich and the poor. Um, there's just a chasm between these classes that was ever growing due to the wealthy becoming more wealthy and the poor suffering due to ill health, slum conditions, really um, sort of the, the very polarised classes um, between the working and middle classes. So in, in this picture we see um, George Frederick Watts, uh, a, a sort of one of the most famous artists in his own time, really, um, who tried to use his art, I think, to make us more aware of social issues. And he was very clever, really, because he knew his artwork would be exhibited at the Royal Academy. He trained at the Royal Academy schools before um, dropping out, traveled around Europe, but become a, a very successful artist, uh, winning the 1842 commission for um, uh, creating pictures for the new um, uh, House of Parliament, so uh, a, a well-known artist, and I think he wanted to use allegorical pictures to convey these moral messages. The Minotaur um, we see here is an 1885 picture by this artist, which does exactly that. So on the parapet we see the Minotaur's sort of grotesque body having crushed a tiny small bird, which you can just see under his front hoof. And this bird was recognised as a symbol of purity and youth. Um, and the moral message he's signifying to us here is man's bestiality and especially that of male lust. Um, so really his sort of social crusade against child prostitution uh, child prostitution, which led in 1885 to the passing of the Criminal Law Amendment Act and the rage, a, raise, rage, raising <laughs> of the age of consent to uh, the age 
of from 13 to 16. Um, so the forefront uh, of these crusades was the figure of W.T. Stead, whose series of articles on the London trade in prostitution were published in the Pall Mall Gazette in 1885 under the title The Maiden Tribute of Modern Babylon. Um, and uh, Stead's explicit references to the Greek myth of the Minotaur inspired um, this picture by Watts. So a painting there that really is quite damning. Um, and when this picture was shown um, at the first uh, Liverpool autumn exhibition of 1885, Watts explained that his aim in painting it had to be to hold up the devastation of the bestial and the brutal. So using again, this image of the Minotaur to um, uh, you know, really uh, sort of get this message home to a middle class audience who we knew would have been looking at the picture and really um, emphasising the, the work that had been done with um, that change in legislation. So an interesting way that um, by doing that as a myth, you can sort of link it to all different uh, elements of society, but perhaps not pointing the finger so much because at the end of the day, it's a picture of the Minotaur, um, the creature that uh, lived in, um, in the labyrinth in Greek mythology. So a very clever way of disguising um, uh, that, that moral message, but also making sure it was understood. Edward Robert Hughes was the nephew of Arthur Hughes and his symbolist paintings really uh, do set him apart, I think, from other artists at this time. You know, direct comparison with the Minotaur we've just seen shows some quite different approaches to artwork, use of um, the mythical creature. And here we have uh, the Pegasus-like dark black horse with a Valkyrie from North, Norse mythology riding across the sky above uh, this imagined cityscape. And what Hughes is doing in this instance is taking us away from um, the city where, where the Minotaur haunts the streets and moving us up into the air in the sky with the hope that we can fly off with this figure into the light which lies ahead. Um, and lots of Hughes's artworks share this same blue ethereal colour um, within the, the sky and the atmosphere and the characters themselves. So again, he's using mythology uh, as such an accepted tradition in society as something that we know to be real. We know the stories uh, of the stories of generations which link us to the past. And he's inviting us, I think, to see forward into the future of, uh, of what the possibilities of retelling those myths are um, and how it's the kind of storytelling almost that can have this transformative effect on us and remove us from reality. A really beautiful picture um, that, uh, that I love uh, there actually, that one. And that belongs to um, Birmingham City Art Gallery. Another winged creature now, maybe not a monster as I've entitled the slide, uh, but I wanted to include Annie Swinnerton's Sense of Sight, 1895. And this is at the Walker Art Gallery uh, in Liverpool. Um, Annie Swinnerton was uh, an amazing artist, um, one of the first to enter a uh, Royal Academy to become a Royal Academician, one of the first women, sorry, to become a Royal Academician. And her work is slowly starting to be appreciated and celebrated for, um, its, its quality and its engagement and her you know, fabulous ability as an artist. I wanted to share Sense of Sight above some of her other pictures and symbolist pictures because of her use of these beautiful angel wings. Uh, and much in the way Burne Jones believed he'd drawn his mermaids from life, I think we get a sense that Swinnerton has probably studied the billowing drapery with the same intense study as she has done probably bird's wings, uh, unless she did get her hands on an angel, who knows, uh, to copy the beautiful feathers with pristine accuracy, which gives this painting a lightness and a lifelikeness, um, which makes this mythical angel, I think, completely believable. The title is The Sense of Sight. And as you see, the angel raises her hands as though a vision has appeared to her um, and uh, much in the same way Hughes used his symbolism and the mythical animals to inspire sort of another worldliness, I think, in the viewer. That's certainly what's going on with Swinnerton. She's not just looking at the world around her. In fact, she's not looking at the world around her at all. Her sight is raised up to the skies and this is indicative of a second sight or a second seeing. Um, and again, that idea that the symbolists wanted to use their artwork 
to transform the viewer from the mundane and the ordinary into something greater and grander than they did before. Um, of course, you could have just used a, a woman, but the addition of the angel wings adds that idea that there's um, a synergy, a connection, and a root almost from the world that we inhabit, identifiable by a different animal, uh, the, the very humble sheep just on the hillside behind her with this great, powerful, godly creature, which we see presented at the front of the canvas. One of my favorite pre-Raphaelite paintings, uh, Santa Eulalia um, by John William Waterhouse, which is in the Tate Galleries. Waterhouse uh, was a, an amazing picture who often focused his paintings on women, um, single figures, sometimes from mythology, sometimes saints, as we're looking at now. He also liked a good fantastical beast as well and made many sea nymphs. Um, but I've decided to focus on this picture of Saint Eulalia, uh, Saint, yes, uh, for the doves that appear in the picture. So you can see here um, that we have. Um, the, the story or the myth, the legend of uh, Saint Eulalia, um, which is, a, I mean, it's a terrible story really. So she was martyred in 304 AD for refusing to make sacrifices to the Roman gods due to her Christianity. And her method of death was particularly horrific as two executioners tore her body apart with hooks, then lighted torches, applied them to her breasts and sides until finally as the fight caught her hair, she was suffocated. Supposedly she was only 12 years old when this episode took place. Um, and again, Waterhouse uses realism to try and negotiate this, uh, this story and to give it, I think, some whack and really hammer home the sort of terrible tragedy which is at the center of that picture. Um, so we know that he painted it um, uh, sort of in, in Madeira, in Spain, um, with those particular architectural features, um, making the picture feel a little bit more real. The doves, of course, in the picture here, these snow white doves, um, which uh, sit around the miraculous snow uh, that came um, to cover up the, the body, um, in the middle of summer in Spain, um, sort of sit around the snow and I think almost stand in for it. Um, this, uh, you know, beautiful doves among the pigeons that again sort of gives us some indication of um, this idea that the dove of course is the image of Christ and peace coming after a turbulent time. Uh, and his inclusion of them there with pigeons again goes back to this I idea that I've been talking about uh, of this sort of blurred lines between fantasy and reality uh, that have sort of really allow us to to feel as though we're facing this scene straight on and his very clever uh, meticulously accurate, accurate foreshortening of um, Saint Eulalia's body on the floor as we look at her really does make this picture feel as though it's one that we could walk into and sort of witness the horrific scene for ourselves and having the doves I think in flight at our eye level which is where it hangs in Tate sort of very cleverly makes you sort of want to dodge out of the way of the oncoming dove and um, uh, and uh, you know sort of feel that involvement in the picture. Doves to uh, symbolise innocence and peace um, are used widely throughout uh, Victorian painting. Um, but this was a good excuse for me to show you Queen Eleanor and Fair Rosamond by Evelyn de Morgan from around 1900. Um, the legend of Queen Eleanor uh, is that she was the wife of Henry II um, and lived at Woodstock in Oxfordshire. And Fair Rosamond was Henry II's mistress. He had tried to build his house for her in the grounds of Woodstock, which he found by uh, rolling out a string through a maze um, to go and visit her every day. Sadly for Rosamond and uh, King Henry, Queen Eleanor found the thread and was able to um, discover Rosamond and poison her. So a story there of sort of many different layers, aren't there, of, of evil, what stands in, um, of, you know, what, what evil sort of means, uh, who's the evil one, and you'll note that it's definitely Queen Eleanor who's made out to be the villain here by the animal sim symbolism of snakes, 
winged serpents uh, and these sort of horrific floating monkey heads and a great black bat above her head. Uh, whilst Rosamond is, you know, sort of the innocent, we've got these crying cherubs with a, a flock of doves flying off as um, the sort of the terrible deed will be undertaken. Um, Absent from the scene, of course, is King Henry, who who's, who's adultery uh, and um, cunning has caused the whole scene in the first place. Um, and it's it's a picture that troubles me a lot with uh, De Morgan being such an ardent feminist. But I think maybe leaving King Henry deliberately absent from the scene allows her to um, uh, to ask us to understand, you know, that that battle between between women which is sort of one that's all too well known uh today sort of when where's the where's the blame on the the male figure in that um in that episode so a uh, really interesting picture which uh these sort of symbolic animals for evil and for good are used to excellent effect John by M. Liston Shaw um, is an artist that I don't think gets uh, the credit that he deserves. So here's his caged bird um, for us to sort of continue our bird uh, symbolism and talk about the caged bird, which was a common uh, symbol and motif in Victorian painting, um, which quite obviously indicates the entrapment of women um, in society. So women just did not have the same freedoms that men did in um, late 19th century London in particular, but certainly across the country. Women had to be chaperoned. Um, they were, uh, if they were to be sort of seen outside in the street, if they weren't, the instant assumption was that they were a prostitute. Married women, um, could not own their own property until 1882 when the laws changed around that so the Married Women's Property Act. Women would be the chattels of their fathers until their marriage and then they would become the chattels of their husbands. And John Byam Liston Shaw or Byam Shaw as he's better known depicts what is very obviously a married woman holding this cage. Uh, we see he's sort of deftly placed the wedding ring on her ring finger there and we see her in an enclosed space of a private manicured garden. So even though she's outside, she still isn't free. We can imagine the walls around this family estate. Um, and uh, what he's done is, is paint the cage with the door open and we can see that she's actually set the pet bird free, not wanting to have the same misery for her pet, perhaps, as she has for herself. Um, but I'm sure uh, went on to become an art teacher and he taught uh, he taught painting for a while before he was he signed up in 1914 at the outbreak of war uh, and sadly passed away in 1919. Um, but during his time as an artist, that um, that link to his pupils afforded him many different models, which was a handy um, uh, sort of side to becoming an art teacher. And we know, therefore, that the model for this painting is someone called Maud Atkinson, who was an artist pupil who also exhibited at the Royal Academy from 1907. So uh, sort of very generous in his um, in his teaching, particularly of women. He took on a position uh, teaching at a woman's um, art school. So I like to show this painting because um, he's he's obviously a uh, supporter of women having the freedom um, that, uh, that he, he can see just isn't afforded to particularly middle class women. So the contrast to the cage bird, of course, is the uh, the captured bird. Um, so rather than being a, a pet, we're thinking of birds out in the wild, and that makes up a key emblem and piece of symbolism in William Holman Hunt's The Awakening Conscious, which we're looking at now. Uh, Holman Hunt, another founder member of the Pre-Raphaelite and he was perhaps the member who stuck most closely to those original pre-Raphaelite ideals in his picture uh, throughout his career, which was to look at the art of the past to create a sort of a new revolutionary art of the future by tackling um, social subjects, but also uh, sort of imbuing them with symbolism to, to sort of make them relevant. And also a very careful study of nature, key element of the pre-Raphaelite um, brotherhoods. And he, he used that to great effect in his artwork, as we'll see in some of the coming slides. Down in the bottom left-hand corner here, just under the table in this very opulent middle-class interior, we see a cat um, with its hand on a bird, which it has caused. Now the cat, quite clearly represents the young chap that we're looking at here in this picture and the bird represents the woman. 
So even though there isn't an entrapment that we might instantly recognize in today's society, the Victorian audience would have understood this as a marriage of convenience. Um, one in which uh, the, the chap here has got this second home. We know this one to be up in St. John's Wood, uh, which he's keeping his mistress. And the idea behind the painting is that as the windows open, and we have the privilege of seeing those in the mirror behind the couple, um, she realizes that you know, sort of the error of her ways and that she'll become tossed aside much like the glove is on the floor. Um, and that, uh, that her fate will be one of similar to the bird in that it will just become tossed aside once the cat has finished playing with it. Um, so another picture that's interesting to look at from a feminist perspective as uh, we, we see that um, the blame once more has been put on the mistress rather than uh, the, the, the chap who's sort of keeping her there. Um, but it's, it's very interesting that that tiny detail of the cat with the bird pretty much allows us to unpick the rest of the meaning in this picture. So another picture that sort of talks about moral issues of the day. Uh, and it was a pretty popular subject with the pre-Raphaelites. Um, so here we have a Rossetti picture uh, called Found. It's an unfinished painting, which is now in Delaware Art Museum. Um, and it's uh, sort of based on um, a Renaissance re revivalism, uh, but it's one of the only contemporary subjects that he tackled. So this idea about uh, prostitution was obviously one that rung quite true uh, in those circles that the pre-Raphaelites were moving, um, which we know uh, from how a lot of them obtained their models. Um, this painting quite obviously has the uh, the calf in it, which I'm sure you can all see on the cart just behind the young couple. Um, and the, the calf there symbolize, you know, it's been taken from the country off to the city uh, to go to market when the owner of the calf, a country boy, sees his young childhood sweetheart having become a prostitute and she throws herself down to the ground sort of in this sort of agony for the situation she's in. Um, and uh, as her, this sort of the young, the chap she knew from her childhood tries to pick her up off the floor. And of course the woman there is represented by the calf being taken off to market for slaughter. So quite a sad um, uh, episode there really. And we know that the model in this case is um, uh, Fanny Cornforth who uh, became uh, a model uh, and soon became Rossetti's own mistress uh, from about 1858. Um, she later described how he invited her to his studio and put my head against the wall and drew it for the head of the calf picture, as she calls it. Uh, we know that he made several pen and ink drawings about this time of the heads for both the male and the female subjects. Um, he had a second stab at finishing uh, the painting in the late 1850s, but it, it still remains unfinished in the, Del in the Delaware Art Museum now. Was there ever a sorrier uh, animal in pre-Raphaelite painting? Oh, thank you, pardon. I just have to move around to get the light back on. There we go. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm joining you from our warehouse today. And uh, there's a, a very energy efficient um, light saving method. Uh, anyway, William Holman hunts the scapegoat. And much as I have just had done to me, we have the lights on and the lights off, I suppose, in, in each of these pictures. So the smaller one on the right hand side, is uh, this, this preparatory sketch or the preliminary drawing that Holman Hunt had made um, of his poor old goat. Uh, and the one on the left is the Lady Lever version, which is the bigger finished oil. So what on earth is going on in this picture? Uh, well, William Holman Hunt, after sort of one broken engagement and two sort of terrible marriages, took himself off to Jerusalem and the Holy Lands for a period and um, really enjoyed getting to know this other culture. And one sort of, sort of element of, uh, of that that he took away from him was becoming more uh, sort of involved in religion. And by basing himself in the Holy Lands, I think he uh, really wanted to convey in his pictures, again, that that li link between the sacred and profane that we've talked about so much. So um, being able to sort of access the area where the biblical stories are from allowed him to um, to sort of put together his, his religious pictures in, in quite a different way to some of the other artists. Um, this picture is really notable for its colours and his very skillful dis dis 
depiction of light and shade. The intensity of colour that Holman, uses, Holman Hunt uses as well really comes across in, um, in this pic picture of the scapegoat, um, painted from uh, in somewhere called Ustum near the southern shore of the Dead Sea. And we know that he made many landscapes sketches and even went as far as to buy a mountain goat to use as the model um, for the scapegoat here. He even made the frame and that's got lots of religious iconography including doves so I'm sorry that that isn't depicted in the slides there for you um, and he, he sort of saw that as being essential to understanding the picture which is based on a story from Leviticus. Painting wasn't received particularly well. Um, people weren't used to this sort of style. I think the very vivid colours and this framing of an animal, um, you know, one who's been uh, sort of, the sins of the world have been put onto this poor goat. But to have something quite abstract from a, a religious passage put into the foreground, I think was quite uh, an unusual, um, an unusual aspect to the picture and uh, it, it really wasn't sort of uh, appreciated when it first um, was was painted. So quite a different picture to some that we've been looking at um, and this is Vivian by Frederick Sands. So I wanted to show you uh, sort of if we're talking about meanings and symbols that are used by um, this the pre-Raphaelite painters and of course the peacock feather is a key symbol of the aesthetic movement. The peacock of course with its huge tail is a lot more fashion than it is form and therefore the aesthetes from the 1860s through to sort of the 1890s the height of the aesthetic movement really focused on the peacock and the peacock feather as a symbol of extravagance something that was there just to be beautiful also help us embrace um, the sentiment of art for art's sake which the um which the aesthetes really focused on. So this is Frederick Sands' uh, imagination of Vivian from Tennyson's poem, The Idylls of the King. And Vivian is a femme fatale in the story of um, King Arthur who used her looks to seduce Merlin and learn his secrets. And therefore we can see why the peacock feather is so fitting um, because again, it's this idea of beauty conquering all else in this wonderful aesthetic movement picture. We return to Laura Littleton, who we met as the model in Byrne Jones's um, painting, The Depths of the Sea. And this is the monument that Byrne Jones designed for her. This is a gesso relief copy of a permanent memorial to Laura Littleton that he designed, one of many gravestones that he did actually. Uh, but here we see the peacock used for quite a different reason, um, as a symbol of immortality or of everlasting life of the human soul. Um, so another form in which Byrne Jones is crossing a boundary because it is still at its core a beautiful aesthetic piece. Evelyn de Morgan also used the peacock feather. Uh, we've already seen her painting um, that which blurs these lines between um, reality and uh, fantasy. But in The Prisoner, she's asking us to consider the permanent nature of the human soul beyond the lifespan of the human body. We see a young woman absolutely imprisoned in, you know, what we can only imagine is a tiny space as we're painted right up into the picture space with these heavy bars on the window. But as she looks out with her hands in prayer, even though her physical hands are in shackles, the peacock symbol on her arm representing immortality shows that as she looks out of the window, one day her soul will be emancipated. And Evelyn de Morgan was a spiritualist who firmly believed in the, uh, the everlasting nature of the human soul and indeed that these could be contacted. And with her husband, William, they engaged in automatic writing where they would take messages from departed spirits. Now, as we talk about realism, I think we can't uh, really um, talk about Victorian animals without <laughs> touching on Sir uh, Edwin Henry Landseer. Edwin Landseer. He was an English painter and sculptor, well known for his paintings of animals, particularly horses, dogs, and stags. But uh, he's uh, maybe less well known for um, creating the lion sculptures which sit at the base of Nelson's column in Trafalgar Square. Um, but he, uh, he was a brilliant artist who, was something of a prodigy really, but when his talents were recognised, he um, entered into the Royal Academy um, just at the age of 13 and exhibited works there. 
Um, so, uh, you know, this really uh, sort of a natural talent, but also an artist who focused a lot on um, dissection and studied the animal form in order that he could put together um, these sort of really rigorous and lifelike drawings uh, and paintings of animals. And of course, Monarch of the Glen, this emblem of Scotland is probably the best known one. Uh, however, despite being um, uh, sort of so, such a well celebrated um, uh, painting, the red deer uh, actually doesn't have enough prongs to be um, a proper red deer. Apparently it's supposed to have 16 um, and this one only has 14, making him not a royal stag, but a monarch stag. Uh, so there we go, not quite, um, which, uh, not quite the, the sort of royal stag that we might envisage. Um, this picture was used so widely from everyone by Pear Soap in 1916, through to becoming um, trademarked by the Glen Fidditch Distillery, who actually owned the picture um, until uh, very recently, about 2014, I think, when the Scottish National Gallery were able to acquire it for the people. Now, I've mentioned Holman Hunt as a founder member of um, the Pre-Raphaelite movement, and before he went off to uh, Jerusalem and the Holy Lands and um, sort of became, I think, sort of maybe quite unwell uh, with uh, what was going on around him, and I think his mental health did suffer from his personal circumstances. Um, but before that, we see him as a, this, a brilliant artist in the Pre-Raphaelite style, and it's the attention to detail that we have in this picture, which I think really set him apart from other artists. And that is something that was absolutely favored by John Ruskin, who was the chief critic of the Pre-Raphaelites. Um, Holman Hunt was born uh, in Cheapside in London to a working class family. Um, and he eventually uh, sort of was able to enter the Royal Academy schools, became disillusioned really with the teaching of Joshua Reynolds. And that's when he um, joined the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. So this is a really early picture that was painted out near Ewell in Surrey at the same time that Millet was painting his Ophelia, so in the same sort of countryside. Um, and uh, Emma Watkins became a model, so a local girl. And uh, the picture here uh, was accompanied by a quotation from King Lear when it was first exhibited. Um, Sleepest or wakest thou jolly shepherd, thy bee in the corn, and for one blast of thy milking mouth, the sheep, have take, the sheep shall take no harm. Uh, so this picture, obviously, you know, it's a, a man who's become completely disillusioned with looking after his flock. And instead, he's focusing on um, this sort of beautiful young woman. The picture was condemned for the fiery red skin and wiry hair of Holman Hunt's peasants. So again, Holman Hunt's understanding this picture would be put into a middle class place and he's depicted very working class people, allows him to um, sort of think about the place of religion in society at that time. So uh, he was focusing on the idea that religious leaders maybe focus too much on uh, each other and what each other thought and about discussing religion rather than actually looking after their flock who we see have gone astray. In terms of its animal symbolism, of course, the sheep stand in for, uh, for the, the flock or the congregation of the church. But what the shepherd's holding in his hand is um, a hawk's head moth, which has a skull-like pattern um, across its body. And the fact it's dead here, this sort of animal um, associations with the supernatural and with evil um, really does sort of a, a, an awaken feelings of awe and terror in its audience. So that adds a sort of quite sinister dimension to the message of um, sort of the secularization of society um, uh, sort of folding away under the pre-Raphaelites. So pre-Raphaelite pets, of course, it's nice to think of these artists not just stood at the easel, but in their domestic settings. And the pre-Raphaelites did keep pets. Uh, here we have a Burne Jones drawing on the left of a flumbudge, which we think was probably based on his son Philip's uh, pet cat, love of pet cats. And here we have a Philip Burne Jones on the right hand side with his pet cat there. It's quite a charming picture. Um, John Everett Millet, uh, I think I mentioned, he, you know, he's amazingly talented artist from a very young age and was the, is the youngest ever person ever to enter the Royal Academy at the age of 11. But here we have a, a drawing made by him when he was just uh, eight years old of um, uh, the family pet of a dog. So you can see that even, you know, just drawing naturally from life without any formal training 
he's a pretty good artist. There's a natural talent there. And it's through his pets that we're able to see that. Now then, there's one pre-Raphaelite that really went to town on pets. And that was Dante Gabriel Rossetti, who went on to have his own zoo. Here we're looking at portraits of indigenous creatures, which were drawn by Edward Lear from the zoo at Regent's Park after these animals had been brought back in the mid to late 19th century. So Australia had only recently been discovered and the weird and wonderful animals such as kangaroos, echidnas and Tasmanian devils, which we see at the bottom of Edward Lear's sketch here really did uh, sort of get people talking. Um, but there was one uh, man in particular who um, really wanted to get to know the wombat uh, a little better. And like I said, that was Dante Gabriel Rossetti. The Rossettis visited various animals at London Zoo, at the Regent's Park Zoo, um, and Christina Rossetti made some charming drawings from that time of uh, foxes, squirrels, and of course, a wombat down at the bottom. And it was probably this that led down to Gabriel Rossetti to sort of this desire um, of his to obtain a wombat of his own. As far as we know, only one pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, or so one person that Rossetti would have known directly, he would have visited Australia, was um, Thomas Woolner, the sculptor, and founding member of the Brotherhood. So there was a sort of real link there. Um, the word wombat's probably Aboriginal, was probably misheard and is misquoted at various different times, but um, the, the, the word wombat has been used in the English speaking vernacular from at least 1797. In 1862, Rossetti had moved to Tudor House at 16 Cheney Walk in Chelsea, which was a huge house, uh, which had uh, rooms for various different friends um, uh, to, to live there with him, but that wasn't quite enough. And he decided to keep a menagerie from peacocks, parakeets, kangaroos, wallabies, uh, to an ostrich um, and sort of had all these animals living around him the neighbors would complain about the dreadful noise that this uh, sort of exotic collection of animals would cause but really it was the wombat out of all of these that uh, really sort of inspired Rossetti. Um, we think he wanted an elephant, but supposedly couldn't afford the £400 fee that his friends Charles Jamrak, who collected these uh, animals for him, had put on it. And if you think his income was around £2,000 a year, it's no wonder he couldn't afford a £400 uh, elephant. As soon as a suitable specimen of wombat um, arrived, it came to Scotland and uh, really sort of was, I think, um, used by Rossetti to cover up a lot of other ills in his life at the time, such as his affection for Jane Morris, um, who was married to his friend William Morris. And quite unkindly, he therefore called his wombat Top um, in after um, William Morris, who's, whose nickname was uh, Top. Unfortunately, wombats don't live particularly long lives in the hands of uh, wild and irresponsible pre-Raphaelite painters in London, very far away from their native Australia. And William Michael Rossetti, Dante Gabriel's brother, says that I went round to see the beast, which is the most lumpish and incapable of wombats, with an air of baby objectlessness, not much more than half grown probably. He is much addicted to following one about the room and nestling up against one and nibbling one's calves or trousers. But um, despite, despite that sort of initial uh, signs of life from the wombat, apparently he shows symptoms of a malady of the mange kind and he is attended by a doc dog doctor. Sadly, in 1869, as we see in this Rossetti drawing, he passed away. Um, but uh, it's, it wasn't really uh, so much of a surprise, but even though it caused Rossetti a huge amount of distress and grief. And this picture is accompanied by a poem. I never read a young wombat to glad me with his pinhole eye, but when most sweet and fat and tailless, he was sure to die. Uh, so a very sorry uh, sort of end to the wombat there. But this um, 
uh, the idea of Rossetti's Menagerie really lived on in popular imagination. And here we have um, Max Beerholm's uh, homage to Rossetti's Zoo. We see Willie Morris here with a kangaroo amongst other characters in this 1922 drawing. So the legacy of that zoo really did uh, outlive um, uh, the wombat, certainly. So now, finally, just to, to round off the talk is to think um, that if we forget everything that we've just talked about, uh, then we can use think of animals as simple motifs that make attractive designs, because that, of course, is how some artists use them. There was no want to blur lines between fantasy and reality. There was no need to have great symbolist metaphors in there. And the moral justification of the world was left to the world itself. And for artists such as William Morris, who created a number of fantastic wallpaper designs and tapestries that feature animals that he saw um, in, in the countryside, in the rural idylls that he'd grown up in and that he lived in uh, across Oxfordshire and London and indeed on his travels uh, throughout France. Um, I think for him they uh, allowed him to to differentiate his designs really from other floral and medieval designs um, at the time that were being looked at so generously and perhaps added simply an element of fun um, to, to the world and to the designs around him. Um, other uh, artists and designers such as William de Morgan used animals again for that sense of fun in their design and our dragon cabinet uh, in the de Morgan collection is now on display at Canton Hall. The front panel was painted by de Morgan to depict the story of St George and the dragon but the really cheeky element is if you look at the top bit side on you can see it's inlaid with a row of gold teeth, an eye and a snout so we actually get a, a, an extra dragon up on the top of that piece there. Um, Sort of moving away from the pre-Raphaelites and into the legacy of having animals in art, uh, I just wanted to talk very briefly about sort of Art Nouveau um, and the, the, the legacy of the arts and crafts through the, um, uh, the art workers' guilds. And we have Ashaby's um, peacock pendant here. So a piece that is decorative. And what he's done really is, uh, I think, stuck to the form and flow of artwork from that period, but, uh, use the animal really to stand in for that. So it becomes less of a peacock or an animal and more uh, sort of a decorative piece. Um, and I think finally, yeah, just to finish off, uh, we'll have a look at uh, this tile by Walter Crane. And again, it's animals that have been used for their decorative quality. So with the swan's bodies, they um, are able to become part of this double oval shape with the reeds and the pond reeds that are around them. And the way that Crane has bent their necks together to give us this beautiful S shape we know that swans have and lifted their wands allows the whole body of the swan to be fanned out into the constraints of a square tile. So he's managed to arrange these beautiful rounded forms into that single square tile. And if you imagine that being repeated across the wall, you can see that we end up with sort of a beautiful naturalistic curvature despite that square restraint. So an animal body, really a useful tool, I suppose, for decorative artists who are trying to create naturalistic forms and folds um, in their decorative art, which ultimately uh, isn't naturalistic at all. Thank you very much. Uh, that's been a quick run through of a number of different uh, elements um, uh, of the arts and crafts movement and pre-Raphaelite painting that include animals and some of the reasons behind that. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to take questions. I know that I've gone a little bit over time. Like I said, there was quite a lot to fit in there. Um, so in the dream idyll, is the city depicted actually London is the first question. Thank you, Lauren. No, it's not. I think it's an imagined city um, based on uh, a number of um, of different cities um, is my understanding of that one. So you see, I'm sorry, completely lost the uh, PowerPoint in trying to go to another slide there for us. Let's try again. Um, you can see that there's a, a, a sort of a citadel and um, a beautiful sort of rounded cathedral-like building. So yeah, it could be Florence, it could be London. I think it's an imagined um, city that we're looking down on. There we go forgotten how to use PowerPoint. There we go. Thank you. Any other questions from anybody?
do my best <laughs> pre pre raphaelite animals like i say it was um thank you for indulging me because it really was that first burn show and sketch when i just found out they've written drawn from life on the back of it i just thought you know there's so much in that very simple sentence against an animal that i think you know maybe quite a lot of us wish existed and would like to believe in and it shows a, a sort of a, a, a a desire to obtain the unobtainable and that want of escapism that I think we all have you know it's, it's why we read books and watch films and visit art galleries isn't it that idea of escapism and it was a really tough time for Burne Jones I think just after the sort of very public and scandalous affair with Maria Zambarco had ended that want to not only take himself away from London and off to the coast but to enter a completely new world and as such a fabulous artist he was more than able to um, create that for himself and just in that very simple sentence you see how he's trying to link his new reality with the sort of quite dreadful one he was facing at the time um all through the sort of use of an animal icon so yeah it's a it's an interesting subject and um thank you for indulging me and and listening to the talk today and thank you for your lovely comments but if there's no other questions i shall let you all get on with your lunch time Lovely. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.